Happy Sunday, everyone. Let's start with a song this morning. We're going to sing out of our white hymn books. This is going to be hymn number 581. We have heard the joyful sound. Let's sing together. This morning it's good energy in here even though it's still kind of a little different but i hope that you've had a wonderful week and i pray that god has blessed you abundantly because he's so good amen, amen. he continues just to bless us and help us and sustain us just like he said he would so i hope that you've had a uh, a wonderful week you know it was a certainly a strange week you know as the kids are starting to kind of get back into some type of uh normalcy as strange as it is you know hopefully we'll can we'll let that continue um, you know, and, and we need to be praying much about that. I'm going to talk about that in just a minute. But, hey, I wanted to mention this to you guys since we don't have a bulletin. Y'all remember back in the spring, you know, that we canceled homecoming because we just couldn't, you know, now we're kind of getting back into some type of uh, semi-normalcy, not what we want. But the thought was we'll punt it to the fall because we thought all of, I, I wouldn't say all of us, I thought that this would be over with, right? And we'd be done because no virus can withstand the Alabama heat. It gets into August, it's going to die. You know, it, there's no way it's going to survive it. Well, it's surviving it, right? And we're still dealing with it uh, each day, uh, each week now. So I don't have a date uh, for you yet. I'm confirming that with the ladies uh, of the committee. But I will tell you that sometime soon I will announce the date. And we're not, it's going to be different. We're not going to have a meal. We can't do what we normally do. But I do want to let you know that 125 years is worth celebrating. Amen. And it's worth uh, having a special day for and I know that the committee has worked really hard in providing some really cool things that you're going to want to have and see so we're going to honor that this fall sometime soonish I'll let you know maybe next week uh, as far as the date is concerned but we'll just what we'll do is that day we'll have a day focused upon the church and what God has done and blessed us with 125 years of service to him in this community and we'll honor that that day does that sound okay it'll be a little different and listen, I'll tell you, one thing that COVID has messed up is our meals. I'm very upset about that. I mean, I, now, I think I read, but the CDC says that you can cook it and bring it to my house. I think, that, I think that's okay. I think that's okay. So if you want to do that, that will be fine. Outside of that, we won't have it here at the church, but we can have it at my table in my house. So let's just, do, let's just plan on that, shall we? Oh, Kelly, can we fit everybody in the house? I'm sure that won't be a problem. But anyway, it happened. So, but, uh, so that's going to, I'll give you some more information coming, but I want you to know we're going to celebrate and give God thanks for 125 years at Sarah Gossip First Baptist Church. You with me? Amen. We're going to give God thanks for that. Um, uh, as far as, I do want to mention here, I'm going to let Trish uh, tell us something she's got on, on her heart as far as the schools. You know, uh, that's certainly been on my mind. Be much in prayer. Continue to do that. Uh, for our students, for our administrators, for those that serve in any capacity in our entire county and cities, uh, that the Lord will bless us. And Trish, I'm going to turn it over to you and let you mention something to the church. Okay. Um, this has just been on my heart, and I wanted to just beg to the prayers uh, specifically, and I just wanted to break it down just a little bit for you. First of all, please pray for our leaders, our national leaders, Amen. because they are we're all in unprecedented time. We don't know how to handle this, and we're making decisions the best that we can. So please be in prayer for your superintendents and your board leaders at the, and the workers at the central office. 
like I said, they're trying to make the best decision that they can and trying to make everybody happy. And as what you know, you can't make everybody happy. No. So that's just, you know, something you need to uh, pray for. Also, bringing it on down, your school principals and assistant principals, they're trying to make the state happy, the board happy, and their teachers happy, and their parents happy, and their students happy. Mm. Um, I'm just telling you, it, it's, I, I watched my principal this week, and I do not envy him at all. He has just been under tremendous stress. So please pray for them. Uh, pray for our school staff, our lunchroom workers, who are trying to come up with a plan to feed kids while they're at school, and those who don't come on school uh, three days. They're trying to get the food out to them and trying to make it as easy as they can for the students and the teachers. Pray for our custodians. They had a meeting this week of how to clean. And, you know, it's just it's just scary that you think, I've got to get this room clean because I've got to keep these students safe. Uh, pray for your teachers. You're looking at an old dog right here, and she's had to learn some new tricks. <laughs> and it's just... These teachers, you know, I hear all the time, oh, y'all get summers off. Well, I can tell you, I've been working just about all summer uh, preparing for new curriculum that started this year. And for me personally, I started a new job with new uh, classes at a new place and all this other stuff to me. So it's overwhelming. And I might work from 7.30 to 4.30 at school I might come home and work some more, and then I'll be awake at night thinking about what i got to do the next day and if what I did today is going to work. Right. So pray for your teachers. They are tired. Yeah. They are tired. Uh, pray for our parents and grandparents. Y'all, I've got a lot of students who live with their grandparents, mm -hmm. and they're having to deal with this virtual school. Now, I'll just say, not all parents. Let me say this. Parents and grandparents are going to be virtually challenged. Your student may know how to get on there and be better than you, but you're going to be stressed trying to get them on and learn every day. Because we want the best for our students. We want them to be learning. But it's going to be a challenge. And pray for those parents who are working that's got to not only worry about their virtual school, but they've got to find child care too. That's been a real issue. And finally, pray for our students. Now, they're probably the most adaptable that's on this list. They will persevere. They can adapt. They can learn this new stuff. They probably be teaching me new stuff. But pray for our students. They're missing out on some things that we all took for granted in high school and at school. Uh, you know, lunch is not going to look the same. Break is not going to look the same. And let's all remember our, you know, our favorite uh, classes in school mostly were PE and lunch, right? And recess. Uh, it's not going to look the same for them. So they've got to learn to love school in new ways too. But I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that the God that we serve is the God today and the God of tomorrow. And he's already got it figured out. But let's just lift these people up in prayer this week. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Yes. That was Thank you, Chris. That was a wonderful breakdown to kind of give you an idea of the difficulty that our educational system is facing, you know, education, school. I was telling somebody this week, it's just such a part of who we are, you know, as citizens, Americans, you know, it's what we do. You know, it's, it's, it's a wonderful part of a, ch of, a, of a child's growing up, right? It's so important for not just education, but for their social well-being, their emotional well-being, just for their growth in general. Uh, and it's been upended a little bit because of this, but what? Just like my sister said, we serve a God that can take care of the situation. And we've been talking about this for weeks now, so we're going to continue to do that and continue to pray that our God is well able. Amen? Amen. He's well able to do exceedingly abundantly above anything I could even ask for or think. That's the God that we serve this morning. Amen. So let's go to him right now and ask his blessings upon us. And we're also going to, again, we're going to pray for what Trish just talked about. Uh, let's go to him right now. Heavenly Father, God, Lord, we love you. God, as we always do here, Father. Lord, we just praise your name, God, because you're so good to us, Father. Lord, you bless us another week. God, you brought us back to your house another week, God. Uh, here on this Lord's Day, God, just to honor you, God, and to lift up your name and give you glory, Father. God, we praise you for that, God. 
Lord, I'm so thankful for your spirit in this place, God. We're so thankful, God, that you're alive and active in our life, God. Lord, that you see us right now. You hear us right now from heaven. And, God, we come to you, God, with needs. God, we're needy people. God, we need your strength. God, we need your awesome power, Lord, manifested in such a tangible way in our community right now, God, because we're, we are anxious, Father. God, we are worried, Lord, about what is happening around us, Lord, in so many different ways, Father, Lord, but I know there's nothing that you cannot do. And, Lord, you are well able to handle any circumstance or any situation, Father, because you are the all-powerful, all-seeing, all-knowing, ever-present God. And, Lord, we thank you, God, for who you are today. God, we certainly bring everyone that is sick, Lord, everyone that is struggling, Lord, with the, with the virus, God, those in, in nursing homes, hospitals, God, Lord, those that are working there, Father, God, we call them into your presence. God, we pray for healing and blessings upon them, Father. We pray, God, for comfort upon the families, Lord, that are affected, God. We just need your help, Father. Lord, in everything that's been mentioned already, God, about our schools, every name, every need, every department, every person, Father, God, we bring before you, God, and we do pray, God, across our entire county, God, that you would bless and help and heal and protect, God, and give strength and courage and comfort to every single one, Father, because, Lord, we need you. God, we need you to intervene. God, we need you to put your hands down upon us, God, and show us mercy, God, and grace, God, and let your power be shown to your people in this community, Father. And, Lord, as your people here at Saragossa, God, we will praise you. God, we'll lift up your name and give you glory. God, we'll take none for ourselves. God, only you are so worthy of such things. God, we will give every ounce to you because you're worthy of it, Father. So today, God, we just ask your blessings upon us in the service. God, have your way. Draw us closer to you today, Father. And today, God, we just praise you and love you in the wonderful, sweet name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Let's sing the song Cornerstone together. <laughs>
end is coming down, I'm going to share one more song with you. Um, I was looking at the lyrics of this song, and it's just so, so true that I think back to maybe the way things looked when I was a kid or even when Nina and I first got married, and you go look at that same spot now, it's totally different, totally changed, and you don't really pick up on that till you get a few years behind you. But the So, you know, I guess what I'm saying is that uh, uh, fleshly or temporal things are always changing. Um, they're never going to stay the same, but there is one thing that stays the same, and that's love. I mean, I can think even since I've been here, I lost my father, and that was probably four years ago almost. And you know, I loved him when he died. I love him just as much or more now. So it's a funny thing how just that absence and that time does nothing to destroy love. Well, God said uh, in his word, there's a scripture that says God is love. So that's not going to be destroyed. And love goes on. You know, it's why I love Christ, because he loved me first. So yeah. the name of this song is Love Goes On. Seems rejoicing 
Turn in your Bibles, if you will, to Psalm 91 this morning. I haven't said this in a while to our folks that are at home. We've got a lot of our church members that would love to be here. They need to be home, feel better there, and we certainly support that and want them to know today, and I'm looking into the camera and speaking to every one of them, that your pastor, your church members, all of us this morning, we love you and we miss you, and we cannot wait till this is over and we get back to church together. But I want to encourage you with this message today that God is your refuge. And take heart, church. One day this too shall pass. Amen. Amen. And we're, we will get back to some type of normalcy back in our church. So hang tight. Hold on. Don't quit. Don't give in. Stay strong. God is with us. You with me? Amen. Amen. I just want to let our folks know at home that we love you and we do miss you. Psalm 91. I want to talk to you this morning about the Lord being your refuge. I love this. When I look at this psalm, you know, in some of your Bibles, there, in my preacher's Bible, I love this Bible. You know, I can't read it anymore without my glasses. I, I, I keep it because I love it. But each one of the psalms is titled something at the top. And mine says, the security of the godly. Okay? I want to tell you that we have security in Christ. Even in the midst of troublesome times, we have security. I want you to re listen to these 11 verses. This is beautiful. Psalm 91, starting verse 1 says, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow, say of the Lord. He is my refuge and my fortress, my God. In him will I trust. You need to memorize that verse. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at that right side, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high, thy habitation, there shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. Woo, I told you, that's good. Y'all need to go back and reread -read that about ten times when you get to the house. That will sustain you in troublesome times. That will sustain you in the midst of a pandemic. That will sustain you in times that are just strange and weird and off to what we're facing today. These are wonderful, wonderful words. People today find refuge in a lot of different things, right? Some taking refuge in money. Others take refuge in their possessions. And some take refuge in their talents. But this psalmist declares that the Lord was his refuge. The Lord was his. The meaning of that word refuge is this. A state of being safe or sheltered from the pursuit of danger or difficulty. Y'all got that one? Let me say it again in case you, you didn't write it down. Listen, and if you don't write it down, just Google it when you get to the house. Listen, the word refuge is a, I'm talking about the Lord being our refuge. The meaning of that word is a state of being safe or sheltered from the pursuit of danger or difficulty. The psalmist, when, when he was surrounded by peril was confident to say that the Lord alone was his refuge and his fortress. And we, today, uh, in this present time, we are challenged, are we not? We are challenged by the pandemic. We're challenged by 
unrest. We're challenged by the trepidation of an election that's just several, several weeks away, which I'm going to tell you could really is, is so critical that we are in prayer, that God is involved because there is a lot going on. I'm telling you a lot of sinister activity going on to circumvent the will of the American people. I hope you're paying attention to what's really going on out there. There is a, I'm telling you, you need to listen to me as your pastor, and I'm not trying to get political. There are some sinister things going on to circumvent the will of the American people. We need God to intervene. Amen. We need Him to help us. And in troublesome times, where can we go? I can't go to the news media. I can't go out here and to certain places where I can get some facts and get some understanding. What the psalmist is saying when I'm preaching to you today is that we go to God. He is my refuge. He is my shelter. He is my fortress. He is my shield. He is my buckler. He's the one that can sustain me in troublesome times. Amen. If it was good for the psalmist, glory to God, I'm going to tell you it's good for me. We need to go to Him as our refuge. And when I get to God as my refuge, what kind of refuge do I find? That's easy. I find an eternal one. I find an eternal refuge. I go back into the Old Testament, the book of Deuteronomy. And I read this in Deuteronomy 33, verse 27, that says, The eternal God is thy refuge. Did y'all catch that? Not the temporary God. The eternal God is thy refuge. And underneath are the everlasting arms. And he shall thrust out the enemy from before thee and shall say, Destroy them. That's the God we serve. I love that. I, I just love that part of that verse. He goes, He says, The eternal God is thy refuge, and underneath are thee everlasting arms amen. that's what we need amen to feel uplifted by those arms when we take refuge in god he becomes our eternal refuge you know there's it's, in other words it's not like a temporary hideout where we go and hide out for a few weeks and then we'll poke back out when everything's clear you think about like for instance the houses that we live in we love our homes but we either own or we rent or whatever but in the end aren't they temporary aren't they kind of in them Tomorrow we may choose to move, we may choose to sell. Lord may call me home, and I don't need that house here anymore, right? When we, take, when, when we have God as our refuge, though, we enter a place of safety that's permanent, that's eternal. Think about when you have natural disasters that we've seen. We sit all the time down in Louisiana and other places where there's flooding, and the government will step in and they'll create temporary shelters, right, to protect those that are in those flood plains and those flood areas. But even these places are still temporary. They're not permanent. So think about every place on earth, if you think about that we consider a shelter, isn't it only momentary? Isn't it only temporary? Any place that we would declare to be a shelter here on earth is really only temporary. For God alone can create an eternal security for us. And those of us that have been saved and those of us that have called Christ Lord and those of us that have tasted God's goodness and those of us who really come to understand who He is, we have received that divine revelation. When God says, when you're in my hands, nobody can take you out of my hands. He meant every word. He meant every single word. Now that's security. Amen. That's a refuge. When God says, when you're mine, nobody's going to take you away from me. So therefore, as Christians, we can have the utmost confidence this morning that when we are in Christ, that will never change. Regardless of what may happen outside those doors. Regard what this world throws at us. Regardless of what names you may say and what may happen in other places, it doesn't matter. If we're with God, nothing can change that. If we're His, and I've, uh, then no one can take that away from me. You know, in the middle of a pandemic, I mean, there's challenges. I mean, we're facing it every day. There's always something new. Every day is, every day, is it not? It's challenging. I mean, are you not tired of it? I mean, I am. I mean, it's just kind of like it's wearing me down. Right? Every single day, there's something that we have to address. There's something that I have to do that deals with COVID-19 or something. It's just constant. And it just weighs on you, right? So in the middle of this, we're challenged with a lot of different things. We've got, you know, families, as Trish was talking about, very anxious right now. Right? Very anxious about their children. Because you know, that's our most grandest, most prized possession that God has given us, right? Is our children. 
God's entrusted them to us, and I'm concerned about them all, right? So we think about, and we can't go and be with our loved ones. We've talked about this with the nursing homes, the hospitals, and different things like that. And we're really stressed out, and we worry, right? We're anxious. God's saying instead of worrying, if we've made him our eternal refuge, then we can rest and sure that God's going to take care of those that are dear to us. We can put them in his hands and ask for his blessings upon them. The word of God has ensured it to us. In uh, Psalm 37, verse 25, I love this word verse. He says, I have never seen the righteous forsaken or his children begging for bread. I've never seen the righteous forsaken. God is with us. We have to trust him in this time completely and commit our family members completely into his hands. For God has promised us that they will dwell in safety. Are we doing that every day? I'm telling you, I am. I'm telling you, I'm putting my family in God's hands every day. Every day, God bless them. God, would you protect the boys at school now? God, would you help Kelly at work? God, would you protect them all and bring them home? Listen, I've got three teenage boys. Three. If you want to know why my hair is falling out at a record pace, I have got three. Three teenage boys driving. Three. Which means I don't sleep until they're home. I can't sleep. They don't know this, and I'm praying every day, God, make sure that they come home. Who's out? I ask, I ask Kelly every day, well, who's gone? Because our house is filled with children. And I'm like, who's here, who's not here? Right? Well, this one's here, this one's at this, and they all got girlfriends, and this is a mess. <laughs> right? Right? So this one's here, and this one's there. No, this one's downstairs, and this one's this, and this one, and it's every day. Every day. I'm concerned about them. All I know to do is to entrust them to God. Amen. That's all I can do. That's the only way I can go to sleep. That's the only way I can get any peace in my life right now. It's just put them in the Lord's hands. And if they're in the Lord's hands and whatever he sees fit, I'm good with that. You with me? Amen. Right? We have to completely trust him. We also read in this same verse in Deuteronomy 33, he says this. He says, um, you are blessed, Israel, who is... Who is like you, a nation saved by the Lord? He is a shield that helps you and a sword that helps win your victories. In other words, that part, first part of that verse, he is saying to us that we are a blessed and special people. Just like the people of Israel, the Lord reassures us that we are a blessed people. Think about it when the people, when the children of Israel crossed over the Red Sea by God's awesome interven intervention. They began to burst forth in song and began to shout unto the Lord, saying, Who is like unto thee? Except in this verse, in Deuteronomy 33, verse 29, the word of God inspires the people of God to know and believe there's none like unto them. There's none like unto the Lord, but there's also none like unto his people. You need to realize whose side we're truly on today. We're on the Lord's side, Right? And therefore, we are special, not that he has signaled necessarily us out and we should go out there and with our head up high and be so sinfully prideful of who we are. No, but we need to be thankful to understand that God looks at us as his children. And he cares deeply about his children. Amen? Yeah, amen. We need to know that those of us who, you know, have made this eternal God, him, eternal Jehovah God, our refuge. We're a blessed people, chosen by God, kept safe by Him. We need to realize this. And not only kept safe just because of who He is, the psalmist says uh, that He is our shield. He is our sword. Think about that for a second. In other words, shield and sword, I think about offense and defense. Because I'm trying to get any kind of football analogy in that I can right now. We don't, I don't know if we're going to have it for the next week or not, right? I know down deep. Listen, if you're praying for football, go ahead. I'm not going to tell you that's silly, right? You do what you want to do, but get that prayer in if you need to, right? We've we got to get it in while we can, right? I'm thinking about offense and defense. That shield is what? Defense, the sword is offense, right? I said in my little simplistic mind. Think about it in days gone by and wars gone by, years and centuries and centuries, you know, a, a soldier would carry a shield. And we've certainly, unfortunately, have we not seen these shields out here recently with peaceful protesting. If it's a peaceful protest, you don't need a shield, do you, Mr. Police Officer? No, because it's riots. It's sinful. 
activity, chaotic, sinful activity, evil activity is exactly what it is. And these officers, these men and women in blue, have to have this shield to protect them, right? And they have that. Well, if a human shield can protect them and it's necessary in a riot, necessary in a battle, and necessary in a fight, how much more would God's shield to defend us and protect us as he goes before us? And then if that enemy gets a little too close, guess what happens? God will go on the offensive. Not only is he our shield in front of us, he's our weapon. He's our sword. He fights the battles for us. So therefore, when we're getting a little worrisome and we're getting a little stressed out, we need to realize that the battle doesn't belong to us anyway. Because if you think you can win this fight on your own, you're going to get whipped up one side and down the other. The battle belongs to God. He's the shield. He's the sword. Not me. There's nothing I can do within my own strength to win any type of battle against what we're facing out there. This world will chew me up and spit me out easily. However, if God goes before me, ooh, I'm talking about God. He goes before me. He's my shield. He's my sword. He's my fortress. I've got every confidence that I'll make it. I've got every confidence I'll win the battle. I'll win the day. Glory to God. And then the next day, I'm going to do it again. He's going to go before me on Tuesday. He's going to go before me again on Wednesday. He's going to do it again on Thursday. Oh, I'm going to make sure he's out there on a Friday. He's going to be out there on a Saturday. And Sunday morning, I'm coming to his house and giving glory for what he's done for me that week. Amen. And guess what I'm going to do Monday morning? I'm going to get him out there in front of me again. And here we go. He is my shield. He is my sword. In that same verse, it says that, that he's talking about the nation of Israel. But he's also, we can also put ourselves in the same verse, even back in the Old Testament, that a nation that was saved by the Lord. I have, to, I have confidence every day that the Lord has saved me. And I'm going to tell you, if we want to face and make God our refuge and know that when I'm in, he's talking about those, those everlasting arms, to know that he's got me that I'm saved to the uttermost, that nothing can change that. It is sealed and written in heaven. My name has been written down in the Lamb's book of life. He never tells me that once it's written down in the Lamb's book of life, that he'll ever remove it from that book. You'll never find that in his word ever. When we're saved, he's going to put it in there. When it's in there, it's permanent, right? Nothing can change that. So therefore, we're saved by the Lord. Now, I'm telling you, it's very important. Because there's a lot of those that are very perplexed by what's going on around us. If you're, think about this. We struggle as Christians dealing with this garbage. What if you were not a Christian? How difficult would it be to face every day that, that we're facing, and we've got the grace and the power of God in our life and the Holy Spirit guiding us. We've got every promise that God has ever made real in our life, and we can lean on Him and gain all the strength from Him and all the power from Him to endure every single day. What if you don't have that? What are you doing tomorrow? I have a feeling you're stressed to the max. It's what I figure out. And you don't know exactly how it's going to end up. If you don't have the knowledge that we have this morning and they're perplexed about what's going on around them. And I wonder if there's some people who maybe been in church, out of church, or whatever. If they're really wondering about their salvation, if they're wondering if they're truly saved. This, listen, I've told you before, and this is nothing new under the sun. God will take anything and he can get glory out of it. And he can take anything and draw people into him. And maybe that's this time. You know, we, as, uh, as Paul was writing to the Philippians, we can say it's our motto for me to live as, to me to live as Christ and to die as gain. Because i got all this confidence in the world that the Lord takes me home today. If He calls me home and today is the day of my death and that's what He has prescribed for me, that's perfectly fine. I will be in His presence for all of eternity. I have that knowledge in my heart. Amen. How do you wake up in the morning if you don't have that knowledge? I've been saved so long, I don't even want to think about it. But I can't be so naive and so cruel and so passive to not think that there's people in this community, in this county, that are in our life that are not saved. And I'm trying to figure out how are they even making it? How are they enduring it? You know what the answer could be? Maybe they're not. Maybe they're not making it. 
Maybe they're going downhill in a hurry and they need saving. That message still needs to be heard today. It's simple. You know what that message is? Jesus saves. He still saves, y'all. He still helps in a moment of desperation. And maybe it, it, maybe it takes something so catastrophic for, for an individual. I don't know. I know my salvation experience, all of ours are different. But I'm telling you, God is calling. He's calling to save. Those that may be listening to me, that may be finding us online, or maybe those of you here under the sound of my voice that could be unsure. And you want to know, how does that happen? I want to tell everybody, listen, it's no more simple than Romans 10 verse 9. The Bible says that thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You shall be saved. Amen. It is no more complicated. I want to encourage anybody listening to receive that gift of salvation. You don't have to do some type of penance. That's what grace is for. Glory to God. Amen. It's unmerited. I don't deserve it. But he gives it to me fully, completely. I don't have to do a pilgrimage somewhere. I can receive Christ where I'm standing, glory to God. Amen. Doesn't matter where you're at. All we've got to do today is call upon the name of the Lord Jesus. He has already paid the price. There's nothing that you need to do. There's nothing that you need to overcome. He's already done all the work that you couldn't do and what I couldn't do. And he's standing at the ready. We just simply have to acknowledge with our mouth that Jesus is the Lord. That He is the ruler of our lives. And we need to believe that God raised Him back to life. We shall be saved. Glory to God. And then once you get saved, you receive that glorious free gift of salvation. He will become your refuge in a time of trouble. Then I can place myself in Him. Once I'm saved and I've got that right in heaven and my sins are forgiven and my soul is secure, then I can place myself in His refuge. Then He's my shield. Then He's my sword. Then He's my high tower. Then He's my fortress. Then He's my buckler. Then He's that person that I need in a time of trouble. Once I'm saved. Oh, Psalm 99 says this. The Lord also will be a refuge for the oppressed. A refuge in times of trouble. Is this not what the world needs to hear today? Yes. Glory to God. God can be our refuge. Where do I go? Easy, go to God. I don't know what to do. Easy, go to Him. I don't know what decision to make. Easy, ask Him. He'll help us in a time of need. You know, we're living in a time where, I mean, people are losing their jobs. I mean, it's a serious business, y'all. Right? We can't turn a blind eye to what's going on. People are losing their livelihood. There's a lot of trepidation out there. They're perplexed. They don't know what to do in these difficult times. I get it. I feel sorry. I mean, I look at these. Listen, there's business owners in here. And I work with business owners every day when I'm at the bank. I know, you know, it, it sounds fun to be a business owner until you work 80-hour weeks and you decide you don't want to do it no more. I mean, it's very difficult to do, to own your own business. And I look at these poor business owners being completely looted and robbed and pillaged all over our great country. And idiots like to stand up and go, well, they've got insurance. They don't have a single clue. I mean, is there more of idiotic statement ever been said? I mean, that's just idiocy. Amen. And they've invested countless thousands of dollars and countless hours in the success of their business. And it's being robbed and looted and pillaged like it's nothing. People are struggling. And now their business is coming to the standstill or come to a crumble. Let me tell you something. I mean, I'm not, I'll tell you right now, I've, I've talked to many a business owner in tears because of COVID. All you got to do is ask any person that owns a restaurant how difficult it is right now. Right? We got folks that are struggling. It's difficult right now. We need to be assured that every person that is affected right now by our difficult time that we're in can run to the Lord. And if we run to the Lord, we won't find a locked door. We'll find an open door. Amen. And we can go in and find refuge in Him in the midst of trials, in the midst of hardships. I'm going to give you an example. I'm going to close. This example could be found in 1 Kings chapter 17. God's dealing with Elijah. 
And he's and Elijah is his prophet of the time. And right now in Elijah's day, during this story, there's a massive famine in the land. Now, this is something that you and I in our time, we really haven't had to deal with. But back then, if nothing would grow and nothing would produce in the desert, you're in trouble, right? You know, most of us, we go home to our cabinets today. Thank God we're going to find some food. But right now, there's no food. Everything's dying because there's no rain. You know, they need, you need water to have things grow and to survive. And now there's no rain. There's a massive famine in the land. Elijah tells God tells Elijah to go down to a certain place. I can't pronounce the place. Anyway, go down to a certain place and a widow will sustain thee. Go in this, you'll find a widow there and she will sustain thee. Elijah obeys God. God goes, I mean, Elijah obeys God. Elijah goes there. He finds the widow, calls her here. You know, God said this widow's going to provide for you. She's going to cook for you. She's going to feed you. He gets there and this widow says, all I got is a little flour. Well, first he finds her gathering sticks. I'm going to get my story right. He finds her gathering sticks. He says, hey, come up here and give me a piece of cake, which is, you know, some type of like a, like a cornbread, which, by the way, you can send that to the house, too. Um, I love cornbread. You know, particularly, I'm going to cut all the edges off, and I'll give you the rest. But anyway, edges are the best part. Anyway, right? So where am I at? <laughs> I'm just trying to get some food today. Right? So I haven't had breakfast. Listen. <laughs> so anyway... She's gathering sticks, and he says, come here and give me a little bit of cake. She says, I don't have anything to give you. She says, matter of fact, all I've got is a little bit of flour and a little bit of oil, and I'm going to make this little cake for me and my son. She's a widow. She's got no husband, right? So she's got a son to take care of. She's got nobody that can help her there. She's, I've got a little bit of flour. I've got a little bit of oil. I'm going to build a fire. I'm going to cook one cake for me and my son, and we're going to go over there, and we're going to die because that's all i got. In other words, it's going to be our final meal. I've got nothing else. That's all I have to my name. And we're going to starve to death, me and my son. So God sent Elijah to hear that, right? So Elijah could have turned around and said, what? God, what are you doing? I thought you said this person was going to sustain me. She's got nothing. How is she going? She can't even feed herself and her son. She sure can't feed me too. She's about to go over here after this final little cake they're going to eat. And they're going to starve to death. That's all they got. This woman didn't have much hope. Except God had sent her, the prophet, purposefully, willingly, to include her into this story. Not just to, to provide for the prophet, but to teach her a very valuable lesson. So what did Elijah say? Well, lady, you may need to figure out something. I don't know. You need to go down to the Dollar General and see if they'll give you something. I don't know. You better go find something. You know, I don't know. You need to go to the grocery store. They didn't have any grocery store. What did Elijah say? Don't worry about it. Elijah said, don't fear. Don't you worry about it. Now think about that for a second. That's not the answer she's expecting. How do you, what do you mean don't worry? How can I not worry? This is all I've got. There is no other way or means that I can provide for me and my son. There's a massive famine in the land. There's nothing else coming in. This is it. We are about to die. It seemed that God knew and understood this widow's deep emotions. And he was moved with compassion to help her. And he wanted to reassure her through his prophet that there was nothing to fear. That God was still in control of her life in the midst of a very difficult situation. Today there's so many to, in our community that's gripped with fear because of what's going on with the pandemic and other unrest and other things going on in our country. And think about this also that, that yields more stress. There's a constant barrage of I want to call it information, but really I mean misinformation from the media. And if you spend 15 minutes pay, reading the headlines, you will lose your peace of mind every day. Will you not? Amen. Yeah. If you really get into the stories, you're really going to lose it. If you just read the headlines, you're going to lose your peace of mind. Now, we should be informed. I try to read every day. I enjoy I try to keep up with current events. We need to know about things that are happening around us. But if we're constantly filling our minds with negativity, right, with negative information, we will become agitated. We will become fearful. If that's all that we feed ourselves, if that's all that we see, that's all that we hear, we will become negative. We will become fearful. We have to allow, listen to me, we have to allow the Word of God to take control of our lives 
and bind these fears on the basis of God's Word. In other words, when we start reading and we're hearing, and it's every day, and it's a barrage of this every day. Let me tell you something. Purposely done, by the way, by people with sinister, sinister agendas. Purposely trying to cause unrest. We have got to allow the Word of God and call upon the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit to bind that up by the Word of God and His promises. And said, I know what the world's saying, glory to God, but I know what the Word of God says. And I'm going to claim that the Word of God is true and not this garbage that I'm reading. That God's got a way. He's going to make a way where there seems to be no way. He's about to do this for this little widow. There seems to be no way. She says, man, my son's about to die. God says, not on my watch. Not right now. Not right now. We have to be cautious. Wash your hands. Keep six feet apart and all that kind of stuff. I'm so tired of hearing that. But yeah, we got to do it. We got to do it. Do it. I'm with you. I'm doing it too. We've got to be cautious, but we never need to forget, church, that God is in control. Amen. He is. He can overcome our fears. He can help us. And I see in the same story, and I'm trying to hurry real quick, God's provision. God set a time for this widow. And what did he do? Through the words of Elijah, using Elijah as his mouth, but he says, I'm telling you that that jar of flour will not go empty. That jug of oil, whatever it's called, will not run out until there's rain. He says, it will not subside. I will get... So now think about this for a second. So when she dips out a little flour, whoo, there's still flour. I'm going to take more flour. It didn't go down. Now that's got to be kind of cool, right? Think about when you... You, you, know you, you know you took out two cups, but there's still two more cups. I poured out the oil. She goes, oh, there's still oil. Oh, still oil. Oh, she's poured it out, and it doesn't go down because God provided, Amen. just like he said he would. What is the God saying in my mind to this widow? I think he's saying the same that he's, to her as he's saying to you this morning. And what is that? I think God is saying to us all today, until things return to normal, you're under my care, and I will provide for you. Amen. Amen. I think that's what he's saying to her. I think it's what he's saying to you. Until it gets back to normal, until it rains, I got you. Until it gets back to where things typically are, I will provide for you. I think that's what he's promising us today. That he's promising you and I today that there is protection in the midst of these calamities. We can, he's assuring us that he will be there and he will provide. He will take care of all of our needs. And all we've got to do is hold on to the word of God. Hold on to his promises. Cling to him with complete trust, knowing today that God will never fail you. Amen. Never. And I'm going to conclude by reminding you of verse 2 that I read earlier. Psalm 91 verse 2. I will say to the Lord, I'm telling you this, Lord, I will say to the Lord, you are my refuge and my fortress, my God, in whom I will trust. Isn't that wonderful this morning? Amen. Kurt, would you come on up, Trish, come on up? So the question is this morning, do we trust him? Have we put ourselves in his hands? Those everlasting arms the scripture talks about, way back in the Old Testament, they knew it too. God hasn't changed. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he says, I will help you. I will provide to you. He also says this, though. Here's the thing. He says, come unto me. we got to take that step. We have to place ourselves there. And then once we place ourselves there by our faith, he has us. And he will sustain us all the way to eternity. Are you saved this morning? What I mentioned earlier, so simplistic. Thank God it is. Lord, you're so wonderful to us that you did not make it so difficult and hard. You made it so simple. If I'll simply believe in what you have done for me, that you'll save me. Amen. If you've never been saved, all you do is call upon the name of the Lord Jesus. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You'll be saved today. And for the rest of us, listen, I wish I would tell you, I, I see the end in sight. I don't. I'm just being honest. Do you? I don't know. What's tomorrow going to look like? I don't know. 
Kurt and I were talking earlier. Somebody's asking him this week, when are we going to have to stop wearing masks? I have no idea. Anytime soon? No. Get used to it. Get ready. No. I'm just being honest. No. No. Don't know yet. God says, come to me. I am your refuge. I am your fortress. I will protect you. I will provide for you. I will sustain you. I am your sword. I am your shield. I am your high tower. I am your defense. Woo, these psalmists had it right. Yeah. Boy, they had it right. If we'll just place ourselves in his arms. If we haven't done that, we could be saved and still not really doing that like we need to. But put our faith and put ourselves, put our family, put everything we hold so dear and place it into the arms of God. We will never, ever be disappointed. Amen. Amen. Please stand to your feet. Let's sing a song. Altars open if you need to pray. me and that we will simply do what he asks us to do and we will receive the benefits of the Lord. Just take courage and allow the Lord to be your refuge. Go back and read Go back and read that psalm again this week. God will bless you. Listen, as we're dismissing, make sure that when we leave all of you, make sure you go up to Kelly and congratulate her. Make sure you tell her congratulations. I mean, really, if it wasn't COVID, you could hug her neck and tell her how lucky she is, and tell her, actually, she's got to be the luckiest woman on earth, I think. Because this Wednesday, it will be 25 years that she robbed the cradle and, and found, found the husband, huh? Found the man of her dreams. What? And found the man of her dreams. So, I mean, she just, I mean, I think she should congratulate her. I mean, I think you should just let her know how lucky she is. And you don't know how on earth she deserved that or got so lucky to find me. But somehow she did. And her life has never been the same since. It's been peaches and cream and sunshine and easy. Easy, baby. It's been easy, right? Yeah. See? <laughs> anyway, well, I was, I was going to get a little sappy. Yeah, you went the other way. I went the other way. <laughs> well, when you saw me, you were singing about Love Goes On. Because yeah. I did tell somebody this past week. I said, you know what? I said... It's been 25 years this coming up. And I said, I don't know if our marriage has never been more strong. And I've been more in love with my wife than I am right now 25 years later. So Amen. I joke to say, but, you know, Kelly is one of the reasons I'm standing before you today because of her strength and all that she, she's such a godly woman, such a wonderful person. Um, I'm the lucky one. Yeah. Yeah. I'm the lucky one. So I'm joking. I know that I hit it out of the park, you know, and outside of my insanely good looks and all of that. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I, I hit it out of the park with her. You know, I think it had something to do with it. I still think it had some. You know, you know what it wasn't. You know what it wasn't. It sure wasn't my money. <laughs> Ain't that right? It, it wasn't my money. I didn't have a dime when we got together. So it was for love. Praise the Lord. I love you, baby. And this Wednesday's twenty-five. Twenty-five for us. Anyway, so everybody have a wonderful, wonderful week. You can still